Welcome to Corwin's Leaders Coaching Leaders Podcast with host Peter DeWitt. This podcast is from education leaders for education leaders. Every week, Peter and our guests get together to share ideas, put research into practice, and ensure every student is learning, not by chance, but by design. So Ariel, how are you? Oh, Peter, doing well. So glad to be here for another episode. I have to, let's just jump in because this one is going to be a little bit longer yep. than, uh, than many of the podcasts, but it is so worth the time. So the, the, the book is Humanity Over Comfort, and we had six guests. Thank you very much for having six authors, uh, six co-authors, I guess you would call them, um, who wrote Humanity Over Comfort. And it was just such a powerful conversation that I'm excited for listeners to hear this because every single one of them, every single bit of it was amazing. And even though this was a little bit longer than most of our podcasts, it flew by and they offer so many important pieces of information in an unapologetic way, but also a very profound way. And we need to move these conversations about race and equity. We need to move forward with them. And I think all six of them offered a very impactful way to do that. Yes, definitely. Amen. Well, I will just say um, all the full bios for everyone will be on um, on the Corwin website page for the Leaders Coaching Leaders podcast. But all of these women have been in education for multiple decades and bring just a wealth of experience and research and expertise to the discussion, which you will definitely hear. To introduce them to, um, to everyone who's listening, we have Dr. Sharon Brinkley-Parker, Dr. Tracy Lynette Durant, Dr. Kendra Johnson, Dr. Candace Taylor, Ms. Jahari Toe, and Dr. Lisa Williams. So let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Leaders Coaching Leaders Podcast. I have to admit, this is the first time I have had um, more than two guests on at the same time. So I just want to do some simple introductions. We have Sharon Brinkley-Parker, Tracy Lynette Durant, Kendra Johnson, Candace Taylor, Jahari Toe, and Lisa Williams. Welcome to Leaders Coaching Leaders. Thank you. Thank you. First Thank you. Of- Thank you. Oops, I have to get more time now that we have more. more. (laughs) Sorry about that. I'll do better. Um, First of all, congratulations. Fall release, you've got a humanity over comfort. Congratulations on the release. Thank you. So how about we start with, um, I'd like to start with Johari. How about we do that? Johari, where did the title humanity over comfort come from? Um, that's an interesting story. Um, I think when we started, and, and, and partners correct me if I'm wrong, that wasn't our first title. I don't believe so. It, it evolved. And um, what I can say is throughout the writing process, I think humanity over comfort became a part of our mantra because what we started to see was how it is difficult. The, the idea of humanity is something that, you know, we always talk about be human, mm-hmm. but the idea of being human sometimes is, is, is challenging because it requires us to, to be authentic and to think about those things that kind of sit in us that, that hinder us from seeing the, the human part of the world in which we exist and especially in the field of education. And so the humanity part of over comfort kind of became our marching orders because the comfort by itself has its own meaning, but the way in which we're defining it, the comfort of leaning into those spaces that are not interrupted, the comfort of leaning into spaces of this is how we've always done it, and humanity peace being the challenge part of, but how do we do it leading, leading as humans? So that's, that's, that's kind of my interpretation of the story. I like that. I want to ask, Sharon, I'll come to you. When we're talking about being authentically human in school, has that definition changed over the past year since COVID and um, George Floyd and racial reckoning and all that, has that changed or does it just look different to us for some reason over the past year? 
So that's that's a, a interesting question. Um, so I'll first say this: um, if I tag back to our um, book title, the concept of humanity over comfort, um, we would have to, as partners and friends and sisters, give credit to Tracy, who um, has led this equity work for a number of years in this space, and has often said to people, "You don't get to experience your comfort over my humanity." And so when I think about um, all of the ways in which we as educators have to experience education in a system that was not typically designed for us, certainly what we can um, allude to and have uh, multiple experiences with is that it has changed. And what has, um, what has become clearly evident for us as um, leaders in this work and people who um, seek to make sure that humanity is lifted in every experience is that Adults typically want to choose comfort because it's easy. It's complacency. It's the way that things have been. And when things don't go in a way that is status quo, it forces us to look introspectively at ourselves, our actions, the things that don't actually center students. And when that happens, people begin to think about, you know, this concept of like right versus wrong, what used to be done versus what wasn't um, done and where we are. And so what we seek to make sure that we understand in these moments, um, as our students are going through the tale of two pandemics, as adults are pushing through with um, COVID-19 and the cases with George Floyd and countless other African-Americans who have um, witnessed the atrocities of um, a civil a justice system that is not civil all the time, is that we have to make sure that we have a understanding of where kids are and what they are experiencing, the things that they are seeing, how we can incorporate those things within our teaching and how we can be empathetic to the experiences that they're having, um, knowing that everybody's home life is going to look different, the ways in which they experience education as it is now and as it was, and certainly what it should become, because if nothing else, being in this pandemic should have taught us that education as it used to be cannot exist moving forward. Um, and I can probably go on and on and tag um, my other five partners in all of this, but um, what we certainly hope to get out of this conversation and the publication of our book is that when we think about um, this work and being present in this work, we have to be completely human in our approach. We have to be introspective in the way that we do things. And we have to understand that it doesn't happen without community. Can I follow up? And then I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to go to Tracy after this, but you used the word introspective twice. And the first time you used it, it I sort of leaned into it and then you used it a second time. Do you think people are introspective enough? Or do you think that they're not being authentically introspective enough, if that makes sense? So I think two things can be true at the same time. I think that people cannot be introspective enough and not really think about being introspective about what they should be. So certainly um, I, I encourage people to lean in, particularly when things are uncomfortable because it is in that space that you really uncover what is it about me that I am not feeling comfortable about? Where do my bias come in, whether those things that impact people in a negative way or a positive way? And how do I seek to bring in the cultural connection that may be um, distant at this moment to understand how I can be a part of a working solution or a viable solution to impact that change? I like, I like that. I have to admit, I... Um... I run a web show called The Seat at the Table for Ed Week, and we've been doing it since June of 2020. And there have been a lot of conversation about race and equity. And I do a lot of work on inclusion, did my doctoral work on safeguarding LGBTQ students. I always felt like I got it. But in the past year, I realized I didn't get it enough. I really did. And I, I mean, I remember, and I've talked to her about it, but I was having a conversation with Zaretta Hammond um, on the show. And I said some things, and I was like, Wow, that's my perspective coming right out of my mouth. So I get where you're coming from. And honestly, it's um, you're right. In some cases, it's hard because you, you don't always say the right thing, but it's been some of the most powerful learning experiences I've had. And I've been in education for almost 27 years or something. Tracy, I wanna, I wanna go to you. Um, one of the topics that I've been focusing on quite a bit through Education Week, and I mentioned Education Week just because, you know, Leaders Coaching Leaders is sponsored by Corwin, my publisher, and I've certainly talked about these topics within some of my books, but through Education Week, it's a week-by-week -week thing that we're doing. 
And we've been focusing a lot on critical race theory. Um, and as the days go on, it seems like there's more and more pushback. And there are there's legislation that is being passed in states saying you can't, you know, we are going to forbid people from talking about it. We know there's the political sides that'll talk about what they say critical race theory is, but it's really not. How is this, the, this, this, what seems to be pushback at a time where we need to be moving forward so much more, how is this pushback working into your work that you do, especially in the book, Humanity Over Comfort? Is that a good question? <laughs> sure, Peter. <laughs> Um, I, so I think that um, it's interesting you raise this question because actually my partners and I have been having this conversation um, for much longer than it's been public, if you will. Um, one of the things that we are clear about, and I think it goes to the comments that you've already heard in terms of why we decided to write the book. These are not new conversations. They just they just morph. They just change, right? The system that we are trying so hard in our respective work um, professionally and in our collective work as um, partners, right, is really grounded in this belief that we really have to interrogate the systems and structures and really dismantle them. Because to Sharon's point, they were never really designed for us. And so critical race theory, among many other tools that are available, is a way to engage in that conversation. The interesting thing is that it really is a manifestation of the system pushing back. So when you push a system, and so when Sharon talks about the tale of two pandemics, as, as she's coined that term, in terms of the COVID-19, the pandemic, and all of the social justice and civil unrest that we've been experiencing as a nation, as those things have happened, what you see is really people pushing back. You see systems pushing back. But you have to think, at the beginning of all of this, when education started, there was no social media. There was no Facebook, no Twitter. There was no way for all of this information to get out. So it's not like these things weren't happening. They just weren't as known. And as people are coming into consciousness, right, as people are waking up, as people are engaging in ways that they have been forced to because the evidence is so clear, as people are moving into those spaces, what's happening is it is a push on the system. And when you push a system, it pushes back and it pushes back harder. It really is like we're talking about in terms of COVID, we're talking about the Delta variant. It is a new variant. It is a new catalyst that people are using to come together, to have conversations, to push against that which they don't know, that, that which they don't want others to know about. And so when we talk about the use of critical race theory, right, what people are often also talking about is this notion that we really don't want to teach history. You know, the, we I have said previously in other spaces and my partners, you know, have said similar things. We are really invested as a nation in the lies we tell ourselves about who we have been and about the horrible legacy that is the dehumanization of the most vulnerable of us to include and especially black and brown folks. Like we're real clear about that. And so because we're so highly invested in this dehumanization, we really don't want anybody to know that that's who we've been as a nation. So the only way to shut that down is to shut down any conversation that would make it, you know, it, it would make it obvious to people. It would put people, young learners, right? Education is that tool that can be used to have young learners either ask their parents some questions. I heard somebody say recently, you know, this is what happens. People are going to ask their parents, where were you when this was happening? What does this really mean? What does this mean about what we were taught? And if that happens, it's going to blow the whole thing up. And so that is what the fear is. It is fear. It is fear. And then I saw something recently where someone said, you know, this is about oppressed people wanting to like take down their oppressors. And so the thing that sits with me is, so then you realize oppression is a thing. And so in our book, it's one of the things that we're calling forward. And we're actually asking people to interrogate what they know, right, what they think they know, and then open themselves up to some new learning. The, the, if it's not critical race theory, it will be something else. It will be something else. It's not a question of if, it is when, it is what, because there is a fear that as people continue to come into consciousness, this system that wasn't designed for us is going to actually fall. It is going to be dismantled. The opportunity that creates and the reason we wrote the book is because there is something on the other side, right? Once we disrupt and dismantle this system, right, it does actually position us to create something that really will be about the humanity of all 
young people in our school system. You mentioned, and I'm going to go to I'm going to go to Kendra for this. So I'm, because I know you're all partners in learning, so I can take something you say and I can actually bring it over to Kendra, right? So one of the one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot when I'm interrogating my own thinking is the fact that when we think about racial bias, when we think about racism, we actually sometimes we imagine you know it's right wing and all that stuff. I interviewed two um, two two gentlemen who are, they're going to be freshmen in North Carolina um, at the university. So they just graduated from high school and they started the Black and Brown Coalition at their school. And they wrote a very powerful piece for Ed Week where they talked about it's more than a lawn sign. And they were talking about the fact that they were seeing all of this bias go on within their school district, even though their school district in their town was highly liberal. And people had a lot of signs about Black Lives Matters and that stuff. And they said, we're more than a lawn sign because yeah, it's great that you've got it, but you're still trying to push your own kids ahead of everybody else from having an opportunity and that kind of stuff. So, so Kendra, when we're talking about all of this, it's not just about a right wing issue, right? It is, it is about the fact that when we're interrogating our own thoughts, just because we have a lawn sign in front of us doesn't mean that we're totally open and we're ready to move forward and all that stuff, does it? Yeah, the conversation is so real and it's so pertinent in this moment because um, performative wokeness is is real. And, and what we have a lot of right now in the booth spaces is folks um, exercising the use of line signs, exercising the use of buttons and T-shirts and sometimes donations and participation in, in, in active activities around um, Black Lives Matters and other initiatives. But when it comes to living um, these efforts, it's absent. And that's what we're talking about, um, the collective humanity, right? Living this work day in and day out and how you show up in spaces. So um, this introspective thinking that Sharon talked about earlier, Tracy elaborated on, is what we're calling folks into in being in community in which we can have empathetic conversations around this work, that we can really speak to what it means to walk in black and brown skin, what it means to have consequences of when you call the police what could happen, not what you meant to happen. And we're trying to interrogate all of those pieces um, as a community and you understand that what if will stop you because of um, we're in relationship with one another and, and really dissecting um, performative wokeness because it's in every fabric of what's going on right now. And our, our liberal friends um, with their good intentions um, oftentimes are unintentionally doing harm and to invite them into conversations to really um, critique and see how they can self-correct and, and continue to do the work that they need to do in order to benefit, hopefully, um, those, those intentions that we're going to assume comes from, from a, very, a very good place. But um, we, we do want to see action um, to follow through those efforts and lawn signs are, are, are insufficient um, in doing the work. Thank you for that. And I, I, because I feel like part of it is in, these, in this polarized political world we live in, it's so easy to point at somebody else and say, they're not doing enough or it's their fault, as opposed to being able to say, and that's why I like the title very much too, Humanity Over Comfort. It's comfortable to point at somebody else and say what they're not doing. But it, when you're all using the words introspection and those kind of things, it's really about me, me looking within and saying, okay, so I have a lawn sign, but what else am I doing? What conversations am I having? And I think that's, that's really important. Candace, I wanna, I wanna ask you a question. Um, in the book, you mentioned, it, all of you mentioned, uh, the idea of intersectional, um, intersectional racial equality. Can you explain a little bit about what intersectional racial equality means? Sure. And um, from perspective of my partners and I, inter 
intersectional racial equity um, is sort of our, our focus in the sense that as people are, and I'm gonna use the example of a school-based setting, um, as people are entering into a space, they're not entering into a space with one ser single narrative. They are showing up with full humanity of all their identities, whether with race being often the center, not often, the center of that. And so when we're entering into these spaces, understanding, and from the lens of our book, understanding that the community around that, I'm not just showing up as a Black person. I am showing up as a Black female. And my story may have a different impact as if my colleague, who is a white female, showing up. So understanding where all of those intersect and then beginning those conversations and having those conversations at that point, because, and I allude to what you said, um, having a seat at the table and being included doesn't mean you hear my voice. Right. Because when you start to get into the structures, I may be at the table, but when I raise my voice to comment and really get into changing those systemic practices, I can still not be heard. Mm -hmm. So that's that's sort of the lens and um, that the partners are, are coming from. And I just wanted to bring it into sort of what a schoolhouse. And I, I like that because I think also one of the things that you just reminded me of, and one thing I've definitely heard over the past, you know, well over a year is the idea of like a monolith. Um, we don't just have one story, right? We all we all come in with very different stories, and many times people will look at race and they they might look at somebody who's black or brown and think there's like this monolithic story, and that's just so not true. And part of the work that we have to be able to do is to just realize that 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 just doesn't make sense that we would think one person has or everybody has the same story just because they have, they come from, um, because they're black or because they're brown. Lisa, I wanna, I wanna go to you. Um, so this podcast, mostly for school leaders, and when, if they, if they came and said, we wanna read Humanity Over Comfort, what is the, what, what are some practical steps that school leaders can take. And then I'm gonna ask all of you to sort of chime in. I wanted to make sure I got to all of you for, for at least one question. Um, Lisa, if, if a school leader picked up humanity over comfort, what are some practical steps you wish they would take with the, with the work that all of you have done? So that's a great question. Um, and we try to write it from that perspective, right? Because we see a lot of people who are in this space who've not lived this work within institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we sort of bring to it our role as insiders, as educators, as consultants working with people um, in other organizations and try to write it in an embodied way. Because like this piece about introspection, it's not just what I think, it's what I feel, it's what I know in different parts of my humanity. And how do you describe that, right? When we think that we can intellectualize our way out of everything. And if that were true, we wouldn't be in this situation. Mm -hmm. So we literally try to write a book for educators and others who are trying to do this work that has dimension to it, mm -hmm. right? That has like um, the calling of the fullness of one's being and put it on paper. Now, we recognize that, you know, even in trying to codify and sort of lift up all of the narratives that we think are so important to think about from the planning to do this stuff on purpose to the it's not just about what's happening out there. It is more important, important what's happening internally to the intentionality around community. Right. We tried to call forward the ways in which we are not asking us leaders to think about not business as usual, but how can you dream a different vision of who we can be? The limitation of that is that the writing, the written word takes you but so far. So how do you then become a part of those communities where you can have those conversations, where you get to leave them with your humanity? You don't get that. You're not a part, a part of the call out, but the call in community that is around. If we say we are about inclusion, if we say we care about all children, can we create a space where we can live that, not just proclaim that? Um, and so that's what I would say is, is in it for the leader who is trying to transform beyond just principle into practice, that we took that, that positioning and we tried to tell the truth as we, as we have seen it, as we have experienced it in a, in a formulaic way to the degree that one can be so that it might be picked up and used to, to transform systems. 
I'm going to go back and thank you for that. Candace, I want to come back to you because you'd mentioned it's more than having a seat at the table. It's making sure your voice is heard. And uh, I know that some of these questions are coming by from, from my perspective, reading the book. What are some questions? What's at least one question that you wish that I asked that I didn't when it comes to the work that you're doing? What are some real ramifications that are occurring in schools in real time related to the pandemic as it relates to students of color? Um, and this is one I'm coming into the meeting already triggered. People. <laughs> so one of the one of the aspects is that we are having different conversations as it relates to our students who are identified as advanced academics. Um, during the pandemic. For, so, for example, we have navigated the barriers of being as a black student into placed into advanced academics because that in itself is a hard mission. Um, but once we're there, now that the pandemic has occurred, it's almost like we're going into a backwards motion of, well, we've been out of the system. We've had learning loss. You're no longer an advanced academic student. That's that's one of those one of those aspects that's starting to come out when white students are in the same pandemic. No one is having those conversations of removing them from advanced academics. So why is it that this is a now a conversation that is occurring for black students when a pandemic does not negate your inner abilities? Mm -hmm. So if, if I've navigated this process and my ability state that I belong here, then that's where I should stay along with my peers, because the the aspects of the pandemic, although real, should not be used as a consequence against students of color mm -hmm. because they navigated the system differently. So those are some of the things that are happening in real time that that I wish people would, would really start to talk about. And the same on the flip end with special education. Don't all of a sudden start identifying more black males for special education because we've been in a pandemic. So just, just those types of conversations. Yeah, and I have to admit you, um, I, I do a lot of leadership coaching and there have been schools that I've worked with where I've gone in to do remote walkthroughs and the instruction, this is not against every teacher, I wanna make sure I'm not shaming anyone, but. The instruction has not been sound and it has not been engaging. And yet I find out, and I've actually interviewed people like Tom Gusky, who does a lot of work in grading and assessment and found that um, teachers have given out more Fs in the past year than they have previous. And it makes you wonder about the fact that when I'm doing some of these remote walkthroughs and I'm seeing classrooms that were not engaging, and then I find out that kids are getting a high number of Fs, when maybe it's not their fault. And then they're being made to go to night school or Saturday school. That to me also creates a deficit mindset and it creates this constant spiral um, that I think is really unfair. So thank you for putting that, that piece in because it definitely connects to that. Tracy, same question for you. What is something that you wish I asked that I didn't? Um, well, well, Peter, if I could, if I, if I could just pause for one moment, because I saw Kendra come off mute twice. And so I feel like she's got something <laughs> really impactful to say. So if I could defer to her for just a moment, I, I'm really curious to see what she's going to say myself. Okay. Thank you, Tracy. Um, yes, a couple of times I wanted to come off mute. Uh, two things. I wanted to comment, Candace, on your commentary regarding intersectionality. Um, and I just wanted to highlight um, the beauty of six unapologetic Black women authoring this book and, and using us as an exploration around intersectional racial um, equity and, and, and look at our, our experience, right? We're, we're, we're six black women. We're not monolithic, right? You have to dig deeper into our experiences. We have, you know, different geographical background. We, you know, have different socioeconomic experience. The, the, the totality of who we are and how we show up is different. And then when you take that into how um, educators are going to be viewing young people coming coming back in the fall, it is going to be critical that individuals are not using this white dominant mindset mm -hmm. 
they explore how they interact. And it really ties into the comment you just said, Peter, around um, what kids should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing, how we're going to score them. Why didn't you learn this? We put you in remediation. You should be identified. There has to be some processes in place for us to check ourselves, to mm -hmm. put ourselves in, to put processes in place that are very different than the processes in place that we had before the pandemic. So these systems that we are returning to, they have to be refined in a way to accommodate a new, a new way of welcoming students back that honors that every young person did not experience school closure the same way. And because they didn't experience school closure the same way, they should not be penalized. One way of experiencing the school closure isn't better or worse, and we need to be prepared to accommodate for how kids show up. And I think that um, that's something that I hope uh, and quite frankly pray that school districts are, uh, are readying themselves for as young people come back um, in the fall. Yeah. So, Kendra, I want to just go back because I missed your, your unmuting twice. So I want to come back to you and give you a second opportunity for this. How does your book help that? How does, how does Humanity Over Comfort help that? Absolutely. So, um, quite frankly, it's, it's, it's a, um, a tool book it's to really march you through um, and walk you through how you would go about that. One step one is starting with community. As, as your school comes back, whether you're functioning from central office, whether you're functioning from the schoolhouse, as you welcome folks back, honor how they show up, create space for them to just be. Um, make sure that you are recognizing that some folks are gonna come back whole, some folks are gonna come back in need of support. And when I say folks, I'm talking about your students and your staff. I'm talking about wrapping around in a whole new way that we haven't always thought about. We talk about student support services. I'm talking about staff support services. And I'm not just talking about employee assistance. I'm talking about everyone, not just people who say I need help. Let's assume everyone's going to need help and plan with that in place. Incorporate this, you know, brief sessions into your faculty meetings. Uh, incorporate these pieces so that folks are, are liberated and taking a moment. And then that in turn shows up in how teachers interact with their students and gives then students permissions to say, hey, I'm gonna, it's okay for me to just put this assignment down and breathe. I feel myself needing to regulate. So it's really a mindset shift. And when you're in community, you get voice around what you don't know. You are encouraged to lean into things and then you start to build awareness, right? You start to examine when things are, are not going well within the school community, when there's practices that are not akin to the shared values of the schools, we can invite each other in to have those conversations and we can hold each other accountable you know, it, to, to get better. So as you go through the book, we give you tools and we give you resources on how you can do that. We have um, case studies, if, if you will, for you to explore so that you can be reflective around, around that process. And ultimately, we are, we are very intentional in saying that uh, the individual's humanity cannot be compromised for the fact that other folks are, don't, you know, want to be comfortable. You know, they don't, they don't want they don't want to be disrupted in the culture of nice or in the culture of I didn't know or, you know, that that wasn't my intent. That's, you know, that's that's really not what we do here. All of that needs to be put to the side, because what we're focused on here is the humanity of each and every one of us. I think if, Peter, if I could if I could connect back to the question you asked me and then connect it to Kendra's point, because I think there's another aspect that I think is important that we surface before um, our time is done. And it really is about our own acknowledgement that there are ways in which 
um, because of the way systems are designed, if you work in organizations, if you work in institutions, there are ways you can be complicit on a daily basis, right? There are ways that you have to always be dialed in to how you are either perpetuating or interrupting all of what we're talking about. If you work in a school system, you have board policies, you have board regulations, you have things that, that you have to do like as a part of your job at the same time while trying to disrupt and dismantle it. So that's a, another like key piece. And that's the thing nobody tells you. Back to this point, the point that Kendra makes about how we design the book. There are sections on what nobody talks about. There, there are sections on your lived experience because we honor, right, that your lived experience is actually a superpower. It actually helps define who you are. You have to really be clear about who you are and your, and your person first. And that's why you hear us talking about the community building. You hear us talking about introspection and interrogation. That is an intentional use of language because we're clear that it has to be a about who Tracy is first in her person. Then it is about Tracy in whatever role she holds in organization or institution. And that is how you impact the system. The system is made up of people. The system is made up of the Lisa's, the Candace's, the Kendra's, the Sharon's, the Jahari's. It's made up of us. And so unless I am different, unless I am given the space to be different, and that's the thing about being a leader, right? You have to make space for people to go on this journey right? And for people to be different. Because if we knew that that was what we needed to do, people would do it. And so it's like, we, we got to create the space. But most organizations are intolerant of the time that it takes for people to build the internal capacity they need to do what we're asking them to do. So we wrote the book in a way that we're just, we're just being 100% open and honest about experiences we've had and about what we really think it takes to do this work. And I will also say this and would invite my partners to chime in on this. One of the other reasons we started the company and we wrote the book is because we are really clear that this is antithetical to a lot of what is in the space right now. There's a, there are a lot of other things that are out there and they are not leading and, and leaning in in the way that we are asking people to, right? It is, you can you can do some things really quickly. You can do a book study and that's it. Mm -mm, nope. You have to really create opportunities for people to, to push, to lean in, to reflect, and to process. And if I could say anything to leaders in this moment, it is to create space for people to develop the capacity you that they, that they need to do the things you are asking them to do for students, for staff, for families, and for themselves, quite frankly. Well, and if I could jump in real quick on that, because I actually want to draw this back to the macro level environment that we don't think about often. We are in a macro level environment of a demographic shift, right? As of 20, uh, 2014, the majority of public school students were students of color, right? We are in the, you know, we've just come off of a pretty significant conversation around immigration trends, right? So all of this, this stuff, it, even back to the conversations around critical race theory, we are in a struggle, right? That is about, will we become the pluralistic democracy that has been a part of the narrative or will we become something other than that? Like we are answering that question by the decisions that we make. And so it, the challenge for me is that, you know, we are politicizing an issue that fundamentally for us on this call is about our collective humanity. But the, but the reality is when you actually look at the variables um, that we are contending with, the human variables that we are contending with, we are also being challenged to do a thing that we've never done. We're challenged to be bold and courageous in ways that we've never been. And we are collectively traumatized from this whole COVID experience. So if we have leaders who, who lead from a, from a way that is like, let's make up for all this time. Like, first of all, that sounds insane to me because we all lost the same time. If there was a loss, we all experienced it. So how did we make up? If we are with leaders who don't recognize the need for that healing um, as a part of the acceleration, right? Then we're going to miss the opportunity to actually birth something new that has never been. And so I just wanted to offer that as a larger context in which we are making these decisions as educators. I, and I agree with you. I think, and I think it's important for leaders to set up the space, but as a former school principal for eight years, I want to be a part of the conversation. I want to be a part of the modeling. I want to be a part of the engagement. I want to be a part of that discussion and, and not just set up a space. I want to be able to be able to engage in it. And, you know, what we know from research from 
Bandura from the 1970s with self-efficacy is that we learn, we, we learn in a social context. We learn through this right here, this podcast, we learn through a social context. And I think too often, I've been thinking a lot about the fact that as teachers and as leaders, people are so busy or they're so worried about high stakes testing or standards or whatever, that they go into school every day looking to teach. And it's almost like they forget to go in and learn. And one of the things that and COVID hasn't had a lot of great, you know, positive sides to it, but one of the positive things for me is the fact that all of these conversations, one of the things that I, I just implore that people do is that they actually go in open to learning about this. And yeah, it's hard. You said it. I mean, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be uncomfortable, but it's definitely going to be worth it. I want to end at least because I want to make sure that I um, have, have talked to all of you. So Johari, I'm going to go to you and then Sharona after you, but Johari, what do you, what do you want to say that you wish, is there anything that you wish that I was able to talk about or your perspective that you want to be able to um, engage into with all of the conversation that's been going on? Well, it's funny when you first asked that question, I now have two pages of notes because I think the question has evolved like five or six times. So let's start with the last one. (laughs) Um, One of the things that I I, I say that I wish was was asked, but just has kind of been sitting with me and we've had conversations about is, you know, the the fear that we have about speaking truth into why um, leaning into humanity worries us so much. And I think there's this dismissal of the fact that the things that we are fighting against and we're interrupting is by design. And so there is this space, like if you think about a therapeutic moment where you can't heal from a lie, you have to heal from the truth. Mm-hmm. So, so thinking about exercising humanity over comfort, there has to be a space of truth telling. There has to be a space of what's the fear that we have when we sit, when we, when we worry about really authentically listening to, to the voice at the table. You know, not speaking on behalf of the person, inviting them to the table, as Candace said, but then really hearing it. And then that discomfort, that that place of discomfort that we have, because it's not our lived experience and the permission that we have to give ourselves to stay in that particular moment. Um, I, to me, I think the genesis of that is the fact that this all is done by design. So to, to disrupt it means that we have to unearth things and we have to say, I've been taught for 44 years that this is what education looks like. If I, if I am reading this book, it's going to disrupt everything I've been taught. Am I even in a space that I understand I've been lied to and I'm willing to actually march into march, move forward into a future where I have to move from spaces that haven't even been created for me because I've been lied to, but the healing can't start until the truth is told. And the truth is not told from a European cultural perspective. It's told from very different perspectives. They all have value. Sharona, I'm going to end with you. Wow. <laughs> uh, you. I mean, it's just uh, I, this conversation. I could I, this conversation could go for another few hours. But Sharon, what about you? So, you know, I, I'm like Jahari. My hamster is running all over the wheel. Um, um, we actually engage with in dialogue with each other like this all the time. So if I had, um, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm probably the, one of the simplistic ones in the group. My question would just be, what are the consequences for not reading this book and who suffers? Mm-hmm. And so when you think about, um, you know, James Baldwin, when he says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Um, we can no longer sit in the ignorance of this is what education is. You know, people often talk about education being a great equalizer. Um, we all have varying opinions about that. Um, and what I'll say, it is not the education that's being provided for me. It's the education that I seek for myself. And so if we are, as a collective group, challenging the epistemology of what is, the nature of our knowing can't be defined by what other people are putting up front for us. It has to be sought by what we seek to define for ourselves. And part of that is a disruption that we seek um, for all educators, all leaders, all people within this field who are impacting our black and brown children in a way that will be a detriment for them for years to come. And what we are um, ultimately hoping is that people are opening themselves up to a a new nature of what is and, and what you know 
um, and also embracing the concept of community, which brings about multiple perspectives um, around the impact of experience and everybody, everybody's experiences, even in similar um, physical bodies is not going to be the same experience. The way that I experienced the pandemic is different from my sisters and we all were raised in the same environment. And so when I think about that in the perspective of that, what I have to know is when I show up into a building and I go to a space of, we have to go back to what was, I have to um, quickly remind myself that there is no such thing as what was. We are creating what we consider a new way of being and doing. And if nothing else, we need to use the highlights from the things that we've had to do in the face of this pandemic to make sure that we are doing the best that we can for our black and brown children. I cannot thank you all enough for being a part of the Leaders Coaching Leaders podcast, but mostly I know that the podcast is ending, but the conversation is continuing. And I hope hope that people who are reading or who are listening to the podcast are going to continue by reading Humanity Over Comfort. So I wanna thank you all for your research, your advocacy, your, your education, all of it. Um, thank you for being here today. You did a good job, Peter. You survived. <laughs> yeah. You sure did. Yes, you were actually yeah. able to talk because you uh-huh. didn't get in a word with us. You were a yeah. champ. Yeah. You were a hey. champ. <laughs> <laughs>to tell you, I have been fortunate enough to be a moderator for many powerful conversations, and this is among some of the most powerful. Um, Mm -hmm. They just, all of them have so many great pieces to talk about, and um, I'm excited about their book, Humanity Over Comfort, because I think the title says it all. It's an amazing title because of the, the the fact that we have to keep engaging in this conversation and take it from me, when you moderate chats, you get into uncomfortable spaces and it's not just because you have to interview six people at the same time. (laughs) You get into uncomfortable situations. I feel like when I go into conversations about race and equity, I always have something to learn. And if I never go into that conversation, I'm never gonna move any further with my own learning. So. The six of them definitely gave me so much to think about and reflect on over the next, you know, few days as I keep this podcast. Yeah, well, and and you're right. The title really does say say it all. I mean, I love um, Tracy. Tracy's quote: "You don't get to experience your comfort over my humanity." I mean, that alone, (laughs) like. That, that could have, we, we could have just ended there <laughs> and be like, well, now let's go think about that. But yeah. just the, the conversation about introspection and being willing to consistently show up and reflect mm-hmm. on your beliefs, on your biases, on how those are manifesting in your school and in your life. I mean, there, there's, there's so much to unpack here. And I mean, you're right. This was such a wide ranging conversation, but so powerful. And I know that listeners will have a lot to chew over for a long time. What I keep thinking about, and this will be the last thing I say, just because I find it to be so powerful, is that so often it's easy to come back and say, this is a political argument because the, you know, plays up critical race that it plays out in politics. The reality is it's not a political argument. This is a human issue that we that we all have to do something about. This is not just a political issue. This is a human issue and all sides of it have to be able to, you know, have to be able to focus on how to, um, how to move forward. Yes. Yes. Completely agree. I mean, this is, this is about the people. And I love, um, I love that Sharon ended with, you know, the the consequences of not reading this book, (laughs) this book (laughs) makes a difference. And I hope that everyone listening goes and, buy is this book. It's Humanity Over Comfort. It's available at corwin.com, on Amazon, wherever you buy your books. Go get it and read it today. And I hope you enjoy and leave us a review. And uh, Ariel, I think uh, we, I want to thank you for, for introducing um, the six of them to me. It was, uh, it was a powerful conversation. So until okay. the next time. All right. <laughs>